Throughout much of history, most advancement, or innovation, came in the form of ideas, or religious ideology. The steam engine changed all that, sparking a revolution that is still felt to this day. Using pressure created from steam, this invention was able to pump out water from coal mines, enabling them to go much deeper. This industrial revolution began in Europe, in the late 1700s, but would go well into the 1800s, spurring another era of advancement, this time called the Technological Revolution, which seeped into the 20th century. Lewis Paul was the first credited with developing roller spinning, which was the basis for spinning cotton, in cotton mills. While the steam engine had existed prior, it was James Watt and Matthew Bolton, who made the improvements to it, that truly caused widespread change. Later on, during the technological revolution, the electrical, petroleum, and steel industries took off. There were massive advancements in transportation, with the first aeroplanes and automobiles. This is when Thomas Edison would develop a number of devices, and is said to have created the first industrial research laboratory. Nikola Tesla also made a number of contributions to the fields of electricity and magnetism around this time. The Industrial Revolution wasn't just a revolution of industry, but of society as a whole, and is thought of as being only second in importance to the Neolithic Revolution, which saw hunter-gatherer societies begin to practice agriculture, and become sedentary. With more machines being used, more factories were built to house them, and society shifted from manual labor, to using these machines for manufacturing. The steam engine, fueled by coal, was used to power most of these machines, like in the textile industry, which was one of the first to implement this technology. Over time, machines were used to create more of themselves, leading to exponential economic growth. They would need it. After Napoleon, Rising to prominence during the French Revolution, the ambitious Napoleon Bonaparte, now Emperor of the French Empire, after the short-lived First Republic, led France to a series of victories against a coalition of European powers, during the early 1800s, replacing the Spanish monarch with his own brother. England though, was to be the French's closest rival. The Battle of Trafalgar, saw the British and coalition forces victorious in a major naval engagement. After over a decade of conflict, Napoleon was ultimately defeated at the Battle of Waterloo in 1815, and exiled permanently, while the Bourbons were restored in Spain. At the end of the Napoleonic Wars, at the Congress of Vienna, nations attempted to restore the balance of power within Europe, with an emphasis on maintaining peace and order, but also the status quo, so as not to undermine their own monarchies. Europe was still full of monarchies during this period, each with different amounts of ruling power. In 1721, Russia was declared an empire by Peter the Great. He defeated Sweden in the Great Northern War, taking back lost land and acquiring new territory, becoming one of Europe's main players. Peter would found the city of St. Petersburg, which became a window to Europe. His reforms later modernized Russia, along the lines of the Western powers. Later on, Catherine II, or Catherine the Great, extended Russia's territory over the Poland-Lithuania Commonwealth, dissolving the state. They would push eastward, claiming Asian territories up until the Pacific, known as Siberia, and even beyond, into North America, in present-day Alaska. Though Russia was invaded by Napoleon in 1812, they would repel the invasion and come out the victor. Serfdom was abolished in the mid-1800s, resulting in some 30 million peasants freed from the old system. Industrialization came to the Russian Empire in the 1870s, and with it, a market economy, leading to income inequality. Many of the world's other great empires were damaged, some beyond repair. The Ottomans, once a significant power in West Asia, lost much of their territory in a series of revolutions. To the east, the Mughals succumbed to the Hindu Maratha forces, which in turn fell to the British. Europeans still controlled many oceanic islands as well. The British had colonies on Australia at the end of last period, and added New Zealand and Fiji later, 
the French had French Polynesia and New Caledonia, while the Germans colonized Samoa and New Guinea. The United States would expand westwards and take Hawaii. In the mid-1800s, Japan would be visited by the black ships of Commodore Matthew Perry. Perry is credited for opening up the severely isolationist Japanese to Western ideas and technology. Around 10 years later, the Tokugawa shogunate would be dissolved, with daimyo ceding their land to Emperor Meiji in what is known as the Meiji Restoration, with Japan becoming a proper empire. After such isolation, the access to new ideas helped Japan modernize rapidly, compared to its Chinese and Russian neighbors. Periods of decolonization would begin in Spain's colonies in the Americas. From 1808 until 1829, the Spanish-American Wars of Independence saw all of Spain's territories in the Americas become autonomous. Only Cuba and Puerto Rico remained in Spain's grasp. The Portuguese never divided up their territories like the Spanish did, which is why Brazil is now such a large state. This made rebellion much easier, and Brazil would declare its independence in 1822, forming the Empire of Brazil. After Napoleon's defeat, Britain was undoubtedly the world's most powerful empire. From 1837 until 1901, the Victorian era, so named because of Queen Victoria of the United Kingdom, saw Britain prosper. Education increased with the help of industrialization, and profits from exploitation abroad put them at the forefront. After Napoleon, the British had no true rival in the entire world. Their foreign policy was called splendid isolationism, so called because they needed no permanent alliances to benefit themselves. This period of Pax Britannica saw the British rule the oceans, acting as arbiters worldwide. Having abolished the slave trade in 1807, and slavery within its domains in 1833, the British would police the ongoing Barbary slave trade still happening in North Africa. They would even control the economies of countries that remained independent, like Qing China. Much of their ability to administer such far-reaching areas was due to the steamship, which used the prefix SS, for quick transport, and the telegraph, for long-distance communication. Napoleon's defeat was the start of instability in France during the 1800s. The Bourbons, relatives of the dead French monarchs, were restored in France, marking a shift toward conservatism, placing the Catholic Church into French politics. In 1830, the July Revolution ended the Bourbon dynasty for good, replacing it with the July monarchy, a liberal, constitutional monarchy. The Industrial Revolution, mixed with Enlightenment ideals from the last century, led to numerous reform movements across Europe. Liberalism and ideas challenging the monarch became more widespread. Originating in France, the revolutions of 1848 were a series of rebellions and political upheaval which spread across Europe. Most were eventually quelled, but in France, the monarchy was deposed, giving way to the Second Republic. This only lasted until 1852, when Napoleon's nephew, Napoleon III, president of this republic, ended it, establishing the Second French Empire. France would be on the march once again, but was defeated during the Franco-Prussian War, putting an end to the Second Empire and the Bonapartist imperial dreams. Alsace-Lorraine was ceded to Prussia in the loss. This is when the German states, headed by Prussia, unified into a single nation-state. This German Empire would later be known as the Second Reich, after the Holy Roman Empire, the First Reich, which was dissolved in the early 1800s. With the empire dead once again, France would revert to a republican government, becoming the Third Republic. This would last for 70 years, and would be the longest government since the Ancien Regime. Italy went through political change of its own. Known as the Risorgimento, the Italian city-states were gradually unified into a single state, the process starting after the Napoleonic Wars. The vast majority were consolidated by the 1870s. 
With the advent of new medicine and technologies, Africa's precious interior became accessible to the Europeans, and they wasted no time in taking advantage. The so-called scramble for Africa began with the Berlin Conference in the 1880s. African territories were divided up amongst the Europeans, so as to avoid conflict with one another. It was stipulated that control over territories gave the colonial power access to the resources within as well, without fear of another power's interference. This also meant that protection of natives was mandated, along with their welfare. This, unfortunately, is not at all how it played out. Conditions deteriorated severely for Africans during the colonial period. By the 1910s, the British would control area from the north to south, while the French controlled area from the west to east. Germany, Italy, Spain, and Portugal also possessed colonies across the continent. Belgian King Leopold II had the Congo, a region in which he was responsible for sickening atrocities. By 1914, only Liberia, settled by freed American slaves, and Ethiopia, remained independent. Over in Japan, Western intervention continued to help Japan to modernize, during the Meiji era. The Hayabusa War Office was replaced with the War Department and Naval Department, while the Samurai class drifted more into obscurity. Able-bodied Japanese were forced to join the first and second reserves for three and two years, respectively. It was met with resistance from the daimyos and peasants. The emperor was driven to modernize the military in the French model. France would help to train Japanese soldiers, and by the late 1800s, Japan was one of the world's great powers. Taking from the imperialists they trained under, the Japanese, and their modernized military, were victorious in the First Sino-Japanese War against the Qing, annexing Korea, Taiwan, and the Shandong province. Once Emperor Meiji died, Emperor Taisho took the throne, granting democratic rights to all Japanese males. In the 1800s, America was still not a major player on the world stage. The infant country still had growing problems within. The antebellum period, beginning in the early 1800s in the American South, saw the country divided over the expansion of slavery. This division became official when the southern states seceded from the Union to form the Confederate States of America, leading to the Civil War. Led by Jefferson Davis, this confederacy opposed Abraham Lincoln's Union of Northern States. Seeking to unite America again, Lincoln and his generals also desired to do away with Confederate nationalism and all forms of slavery in the South. The Confederacy's area was too large to defend with the forces they could muster, so they were often outmaneuvered, like at the Siege of Vicksburg. Only General Robert E. Lee could fend off the Union soldiers, but eventually, Generals Ulysses S. Grant and William T. Sherman kept pressure on the South until the enemy soldiers were starved, leading to a Southern surrender. With the Emancipation Proclamation, slaves were freed from their physical shackles, although societal ones continued to be a burden. The Reconstruction era began after the end of the war, in 1865, which dealt with the ramifications of the war, and lasted until around 1877. Beginning around the same time, parts of America were in the process of reaping the rewards from industrialization. Wealth inequality increased sharply, and the upper classes owning these means of production flaunted their wealth, giving this period the name of the Gilded Age. During the technological revolution, towns and cities in the Northeast would be built around factories. Owned by these robber barons, factories would make their owners fabulously wealthy, often at the expense of their workers. J.D. Rockefeller was widely criticized for using aggressive or immoral tactics with his company Standard Oil, which absorbed most of the competition. With advances in transportation and communication, businesses profited the most, and corporations became normalized. Because of the growing power of big business, government passed the Sherman Antitrust Act in 1890, the source of all anti-monopoly laws in America. The courts declared that Standard Oil's monopoly be broken up in 1911. 
It survived as 34 separate entities, all with a different board of directors. Because of the suboptimal working conditions and worker exploitation that came hand in hand with industrialization, certain ideologies manifested themselves. Case in point, the Communist Manifesto. Published in England just before the revolutions of 1848, the Manifesto, written by German philosophers Karl Marx and Friedrich Engels, described history as a class struggle. Marx also outlined the five phases in Europe's development. Going into the beginnings of the next period, we would also see the sciences advance, with the emergence of quantum physics. Darwinism, based on adaptation and natural selection, also became more accepted. Unfortunately, some used this theory as a means to divide and place different people in hierarchies dependent on race, health, or intelligence. This attitude of, survival of the fittest was known as social Darwinism. As we enter the 20th century, these ideologies would fully come into light. The century begins with many of the same themes as the last. This is why many historians consider the early 1900s as part of a period beginning around 1789, making it the long 19th century. In 1901, Britain's colonies on the island of Australia, which had formed into six different self-governing colonies, New South Wales, Queensland, South Australia, Tasmania, Victoria, and Western Australia, joined together to form the Commonwealth of Australia. To their north, the Qing dynasty wasn't as stable. Failed education reforms and civil unrest, like the Boxer Rebellion, and fallout from the Opium Wars and unequal treaties, placed the Qing in a precarious position. They needed to modernize and liberalize their archaic system of government, but numerous conservative Qing in the court were opposed. This led reformists to take action. The Qing, China's final dynasty, would fall in 1911 in the Xinhai Revolution. This marked the end of the old imperial system, which dated back to the Qin, in the 200s BCE. In 1912, the Republic of China was established under Sun Yat-sen, the first provisional president. This wouldn't last though, as Yuan Shikai, who had control of China's most powerful military force, the Beiyang Army, had been promised the position. To prevent conflict, Sun Yat-sen stepped down, and Yuan Shikai was sworn in as the second provisional president. The Japanese were new to the world stage, and while they tested their imperial metal and won against their closest neighbors in China, they would be challenged by a foe to the north. The Russian Empire, now spanning from Europe to the Pacific, was eager for access to warm water ports on the ocean. Seeking regions in Korea and Manchuria, they would go to war with the Japanese in the Russo-Japanese War. Fortune was with the new empire of Japan, as they handed Russian forces defeat after defeat, a surprising result for all observers across the globe. While the war cemented Japan as a mainstay as a new world power, it caused embarrassment and dissatisfaction in Russia's Tsarist regime. A year later, the Russian Revolution of 1905 would take place. This wave of civil unrest included terrorism, peasant rebellion, worker strikes, and even military mutinies. In response, the state Duma of the Russian Empire was established, making Russia a constitutional monarchy. After centuries of constitutional monarchy of their own, England entered its Edwardian age, under King Edward VII, after the death of Queen Victoria. This would begin in 1901. The Second Boer War broke out soon after in South Africa, splitting Parliament into pro-war and anti-war factions. The pro-war Conservatives became unpopular, resulting in a landslide victory for the Liberals in 1906, although they still couldn't get their pro-working class agenda passed, known as the People's Budget, as the House of Lords was still largely Conservative. It was during this time that the United Kingdom entered a loose alliance with France and Russia, known as the Triple Entente, based on previous alliances. The main idea was to flank Germany and provide a counter to the Triple Alliance, a more tightly knit alliance between Germany, Austria-Hungary, and Italy. 
the rise of nationalism throughout this long 19th century, and of Europe's recent period of industrialization, left them unafraid of conflict. The Balkans were often fought over by many different empires. In 1912 to 1913, the Balkan League, comprising Greece, Montenegro, Bulgaria, and Serbia, took back much of the Balkan area from the Ottomans. During this time, Austria-Hungary was competing with Russia and Serbia for Balkan territory as well. The catalyst to conflict was when Serbian Gavrilo Princip fired the two shots that would spark untold mayhem. Archduke Franz Ferdinand of Austria was assassinated, and the stage was set for a war Europe had not yet seen. The July crisis, occurring right after the assassination, saw a series of escalating decisions made by European powers, which officially began the Great War. The Triple Entente became the Allied powers, and after 1917, included Japan and the United States. The Triple Alliance modified slightly, and consisted of the German Empire, Austro-Hungarian Empire, and the Ottoman Empire, becoming the Central Powers. Most fighting occurred on the Western Front, with trench warfare the norm. A vast area of, no man's land separated enemy trenches, leading to sacrificial charges and waste of life, resulting in many stalemates. On the Eastern Front, trench warfare wasn't as common. For the first time, war was fought from the air as well. It's estimated over 9 million lost their lives on the battlefield, and many more indirectly, through food shortages and genocide, most notably of Armenians. Worse still, more people would die shortly after the war, as an influenza outbreak was easily spread in overcrowded barracks and hospitals. It soon spread around the globe, as soldiers returned to their countries, causing a worldwide pandemic. The end of the war saw the Allied powers victorious, and the end of the German, Austro-Hungarian, and Ottoman empires. The Ottoman territory was carved up and partitioned by the winning side, creating several new nations in West Asia. The newly created League of Nations, a predecessor to the United Nations, granted Syria and Lebanon to the French, and Palestine and Mesopotamia to the British. The Arabian Peninsula eventually became Saudi Arabia and Yemen. A fourth empire also fell during the war. In 1917, a series of revolutions in Russia resulted in the abdication of the last Tsar, Nicholas II, and the establishment of a provisional government. Late in 1917, the October Revolution saw the Red Guard, an army of peasants and workers, take control of Petrograd, present-day St. Petersburg, under the Bolsheviks. This socialist uprising would change Russia forever. Civil war soon broke out between the Bolshevik Red Army and the anti-Soviet White Army, or the Whites. Nationalist groups like the Ukrainian Green Army and anarchist groups also engaged in the war. After around five years of war, the Bolsheviks squashed all opposition and controlled Russia all the way to the Pacific coast. In 1922, the USSR, or Union of Soviet Socialist Republics, was established, the successor state to the Russian Empire. While Vladimir Lenin would perish from natural causes, he was succeeded by Joseph Stalin, a man who would become one of the most controversial of the 20th century. In China, Yuan Shikai's government attempted to reinstate a new empire once again, but after his death, it devolved into a warlord era, in which China was ruled over by different warlords in a period of decentralization. Former leader, Sun Yat-sen, would collaborate with some southern warlords in order to take back power and reunify China. Soon after, Chiang Kai-shek, who replaced Sun Yat-sen as leader of the KMT, went on a northern expedition to take back the country from the Beiyang government and the various warlords. He then turned on the CCP, establishing his anti-communist regime at Nanjing in 1927. This would mark the beginning of China's Nanjing period, which was one of power and consolidation for the KMT. There was social progress, and the economy was generally positive. Civil war would start, as the nationalist KMT fought the communist CCP, who most likely would have met their demise. In 
if not for a massive distraction, in 1937. The interwar period saw much of the globe's superpower steeped in other struggles, as Europe attempted to recover from the carnage. This wasn't the case for North America, which started out the period on top of the world. Known as the Roaring Twenties, or Jars Age, this was a period of economic prosperity, and social, cultural, and artistic wealth. Flapper girls became prominent, and Art Deco ruled the art scene. Normalcy returned to politics with the election of Warren G. Harding, signifying a comfortable stability associated with the time before World War I. This, mixed with the normalization of new technologies, like the radio, automobile, and movies, gave the period a sense of modernity. Europe would spend these years rebuilding, and coming to terms with the immense human cost, associated with the war. In Turkey, the Turkish national movement was established in response to the Allies' occupation of Istanbul. The Turkish War of Independence would last from 1919 to 1923, and saw the Turks succeed in forming their own Republic of Turkey, a successor state to the Ottoman Empire, which was internationally recognized that same year. The capital was moved from Istanbul to Ankara. Up north, with the German Empire now dissolved, the Weimar Republic ruled, but with an array of economic problems. Germany experienced intense hyperinflation in 1923, followed by the Beer Hall Putsch, a failed coup d'état led by a certain Nazi leader. With Germany unable to pay off their war debt, the Americans invested heavily into Europe, to keep the economy from failing. This eventually led to prosperity for much of Europe as well, and the back end of the decade would be called the Golden Twenties. This would all dramatically change, in 1929. Seemingly as a counterweight to the economic success of the 20s, the Wall Street crash of 1929 plunged the world into a Great Depression. It remained the largest and most important economic depression of the 20th century. Everything would plummet during this time. International trade and salaries dropped by over two-thirds. Construction stopped in many countries, and those that relied on farming suffered as well, as crop prices also dropped two-thirds. The depression was the catalyst for high amounts of political polarization. Some countries introduced new welfare programs and expanded the social safety net, while others turned towards nationalist or imperialist ideologies. While the League of Nations was meant to keep a balance of power and ensure stability, they were less effective, as the United States wasn't a member. This caused other more authoritarian powers to undermine the League, making it irrelevant. The show of weakness might have pushed Italy and its fascist leader, Benito Mussolini, to ally with the like-minded Germans. Their leader, the man who led the failed Beer Hall Putsch back in 1923, also noticed the weakness of the League and other European powers. This emboldened him to breach the Treaty of Versailles from World War I, and remilitarize Germany. After Japan captured Manchuria in 1931, they established a puppet state called Manchukuo, with Qing Emperor Puyi as ruler, the last emperor of China. Losing Manchuria was a huge blow to Chiang Kai-shek and the KMT. This helped the Communist Party to spread their influence through mass organization, and land and tax reforms, favoring the peasant class. Apart from the civil war, China also had to deal with the threat of Japan. The empire would invade again in 1937, beginning the Second Sino-Japanese War, causing an uneasy truce between the KMT and CCP. The Nanking Massacre, which saw Japan commit mass murder and other atrocities to the Chinese people, was condemned worldwide. Tensions also rose between Japan and the United States, when the Empire bombed a U.S. gunboat and standard oil tankers located in China. This was known as the Panay Incident. After the Japanese occupied French Indochina, embargoes were placed on Japan. Starved for war materials, the Japanese had to search for allies. They would find them, and share in the imperialist dream. Drangnak Austin The drive to the east 
An emboldened Germany would kickstart the most devastating war the world had ever seen, with its drive east into Poland. The UK and France both declared war on Germany soon after, but the Russians held back initially, because of a secret non-aggression agreement with Germany, called the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact. Eastern Europe was to be divided between both powers. Once the UK entered the war, the British Commonwealth, territories of the British Empire all joined as well. Following a lull in fighting, the Germans would turn their attention westwards, to France. In seemingly no time at all, the Third French Republic, who were also attacked by Italy, surrendered. The Germans would then attempt to conquer Britain, but this proved a failure. In 1941, the Germans would make an even more fatal mistake, and attack the Soviets. The harsh weather, and sheer number of Soviet soldiers, made that conquest impossible as well, and after the Soviets then joined the Allies, the Germans would have to fight a war on two fronts. December 7, 1941. The Japanese would bomb Pearl Harbor, an American naval base in Hawaii. This brought the United States into the war, on the side of the Allies. China would also join, mainly fighting the Japanese with guerrilla-like tactics. By 1942, the Western theater had the British Commonwealth, the United States, and Soviet Union fighting Germany and Italy, and in the Pacific theater, the Commonwealth, China, and United States were fighting the Japanese. The UK, Soviet Union, China, and US were known as the big four nations that played the greatest roles in the war, although propaganda afterwards would tend to downplay or overstate certain countries' roles. In 1943, Italy surrendered, and Germany would surrender in 1945. After the controversial usage of atomic weapons by the Americans, the Japanese would surrender a few months later, marking the end of the Second World War. After the war, Europe was devastated, and power shifted from Western Europe to the Soviets and Americans, the two new superpowers. Alliances were formed around these new spheres of influence, with NATO, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, in the West, as a response to the Eastern Bloc's Warsaw Pact. In China, the civil war between the KMT and CCP flared up again, after the Japanese defeat, with the KMT evacuating to Taiwan, and the Communist Party, under Chairman Mao Zedong, establishing the People's Republic of China in 1949, with help from their Soviet neighbors to the north. With the Americans becoming the number one power in the West, it brought with it, what historians call Pax Americana, a period of peace and stability, for Western nations. The technological and economic gains in this half of the 20th century, developed more than the entirety of human histories combined, surpassing even the great advances brought on by the Industrial Revolution. This exponential growth led to increased lifespans for most nations' residents, along with the development of numerous technologies undreamed of in the early part of the century. Behind this progression, though, was the looming threat of nuclear war. The United States and Soviet Union were embroiled in what was dubbed the Cold War, as neither nation fought the other directly. Germany was split by the Berlin Wall, a grim division of the Western and Soviet realms. Nations around the world were coerced to join either sphere of influence, leading to intervention by the United States or the Soviet Union. This resulted in widespread espionage, propaganda, and proxy wars. Proxy conflicts, like the Korean, Afghan, and Vietnam Wars, occurred because neither the Americans nor Soviets could attack each other directly, due to their increasing nuclear arsenal. The national security policy of mutually assured destruction was the basis for these proxy conflicts, as a direct attack would cause nuclear war, surely destroying both sides. So, the stalemate carried on. In China, Chairman Mao adopted Marxist-Leninist ideals. Older Chinese ideologies like legalism were denounced. 
In 1960, the Sino-Soviet split saw China and the USSR go their own way, each interpreting and implementing Marxist-Leninist ideology differently. Beginning in 1966, the Cultural Revolution would do away with much of China's past, purging many parts of its long history. In 1972, China would begin to have closer relations to the United States, and soon after, Deng Xiaoping would implement economic reforms, which opened up China to the West. During this period, numerous countries in Latin America would elect left-wing leaders, threatening the smaller but more powerful upper classes. During Operation Condor, the United States assassinated many of these leaders, placing more right-wing, anti-communist, military dictators in power. The wonders of space wouldn't even escape this earthly competition. During this new age, the United States and Soviets engaged in the space race to garner a reputation as the true superpower. Starting in 1957, the space age began with Sputnik, the Earth's first artificial satellite, being launched by the Soviets. The Vostok program also sent the first human into space, Yuri Gagarin. The United States would ultimately impress the entire world though, with the Apollo program, which put the first man on the moon. The event was reportedly watched by half a billion people. Africans would also take back their land in mass independence movements, but many of these countries would still struggle after generations of colonialism. In the late 1980s, the Cold War began to subside. Under American President Ronald Reagan, the United States entered diplomatic relations with Soviet leader Mikhail Gorbachev, who introduced the Perestroika and Glasnost reforms. The Soviet Union then collapsed in 1991, leaving the United States as the sole world superpower. So that's the new Super Nintendo Entertainment System. What about it? They say it has 16-bit technology, whatever that means. The 1990s was an era of stability. While the information age began in the mid-20th century, the 90s would see the average Westerner benefit from massive technological advancements, granting them access to computers and the Internet. Developed nations would begin a process of de-industrialization, moving towards information technology, while outsourcing industrial jobs to current developing nations. On September the 11th, enemies of freedom committed an act of war against our country. The 21st century began with the war on terror and brought with it a feeling of a new age. The feeling of never being able to go back. As the old saying goes, history never repeats itself, but it often rhymes. It's easy to forget we are still the same tribal beings who roamed this earth eons ago, and while we all have our own unique experiences, we are all connected enough that they become strikingly similar. The future can hold untold triumphs or disasters beyond repair. So are we destined for a thrilling, senses-shattering, cyberpunk-like dystopia? An arid, post-apocalyptic desertscape ruled by different city-states? Or are we destined for an earthly utopia where we can work together to set our sights on the stars? Sorry we can't help. This is a history channel, after all.